Hello, you join me as I prep to get in the cold tub outside. We're going to be talking about cold water immersion today and we're going to kind of do it sort of a little bit slow. I'm going to talk about different topics, some questions that I've had. I'm going to try and answer as many questions that I've, we've had as possible. We're going to talk about cold tubs. We're going to talk about cold water in general. So the sea, lakes, swimming in Lidos in the winter. So winter month swimming, something like that. We're going to be talking about cold shock and what that means for the body, how your body reacts to it. Uh, we're going to be talking about adaption as well. So when you are getting into the cold water for the first couple of times, you might think to yourself, I don't want to be doing this anymore. But slowly and surely your body will adapt and we'll speak about that. We'll speak about brown fat. We'll speak about its effects over time and how you can train your body to become used to the cold water, okay? Um, when I mention brown fat, this is something we'll talk about extensively, but I'm talking thermogenesis, I'm talking the benefits of cold water swimming on the body, so short term, i.e. immediately after you get out of the cold water in the next kind of like 24 hours, and I'll talk about how it affects you and benefits you um, longer term as well, so potentially throughout the years of your life and into your, your older years as well. We'll talk about some research that um, has been done on cold water swimming and generally cold water immersion and its positive effects as well as some sort of things that you need to be aware of. And lastly, we'll talk about safety. So after drop, what that is, we're going to talk about hypothermia and we're going to talk about general cold water safety in exposed environments, i.e. not a cold tub outside in your garden. Why are we doing this and who am I to be talking about it? Well, my name is Adam. I've been a swimming teacher for 12 years. I've taught performance swimming for about five years. I've worked with many different athletes and performance swimmers. I've taught cold water swimmers and I've worked with open water swimmers swimming long distances. I've even competed in events with those people myself. I'm gonna get changed and get ready. You'll want some trunks. You want a towel to dry yourself off after you get out of the cold tub or cold water as quickly as possible. As soon as you get out, that air is going to start hitting your wet body. That's going to further lower your body temperature. You don't want that. You're out of the water. Now is the time to start getting warm. So get out, dry yourself up as much as possible. Get inside or get to somewhere where you can get changed. Get some warm, dry clothes on. This is important. You don't want to really jump into a hot shower or get into a hot car or stand in front of a heater. You want your body to do the work. That's kind of why we're doing this deliberately because I'll talk about this later. We want our body to heat itself up and then you'll be using your thermogenesis and your hypothalamus to regulate your temperature and that's going to help you adapt to the cold water over time. So important, get out, get dry, get changed, let your body do the work. I will meet you outside. Welcome outside. As we're talking about cold tubs today, I'll talk about the difference between cheap ones versus expensive ones. So this is a very cheap one. We bought this on Amazon. It was probably about 80 pounds. You don't really need to spend too much money on something like this. This is essentially a, a vinyl tub that's slightly insulated. It has a lid and it has water inside of it. Now the benefits of this is that it's currently winter. So the air temperature is about one degrees outside, which means that the water is about between three and a half and four degrees. That's classified as cold water. Now, you can get really expensive ones. You can spend upwards of £25,000 plus on these things, and those will cool the water themselves. So that might be better if that's in your budget, of course, but that might be better, firstly, because it cools the water, so you can use it all year round. Secondly, it also filters the water. Now, the way we keep this clean is we sort of take a bucket out and replace the bucket every other time we use it, and that keeps the water nice and clean it keeps it clear but because it's so cold nothing can really grow in it anyway so it's not going to get any moss it's not going to go cloudy or milky it will stay generally quite healthy how cold should the water be well we did an entire video on this i went through the categories and the classifications of different types of cold water generally though just for this video if it's cold to your body it's cold enough below nine degrees is preferable if you've got a temperature to measure it even better but to start your journey off cold water is cold water and then you can get into the specifics of cold water as you get further along in your journey 
little bit about safety before we get in. With as much training as possible, you still cannot change the laws of thermodynamics. Your body will respond to the cold no matter what. Exposure to cold water can cause injury, it can even cause death. So I'd like to preface this video with a warning that this is not medical advice. I am not a biologist, I'm a swimmer, and I'll refer you to the experts as we go through. So before you get in the cold water, ensure you have the means to get out. That can be someone to help you or the appropriate exit strategy. With a cold tub, it's relatively safe, but your muscles will not function as they usually do and you will lose some sensation and strengthen your extremities. So just make sure if you get in that you can get out. Getting into the cold tub, you want to get in quite slowly, but you want to get in assertively. You don't want to mess about, you just want to get in, you want to get yourself down to the waterline of your shoulders. I'll talk about putting your face in a sec, but let's get into the cold water. So getting into the cold water, you want to get in quite slowly, but you want to get in assertively. You don't want to doddle, you want to get in and get down to this level your shoulder line some people put their face in i can't do that because i've got a hat with a microphone on but um if you put your face in you'll activate what we call the mammalian dive reflex now this is a reflex that can lower your heart rate and it can reduce the cold stress on your body as you get into the cold water your body will be tempted to fight it it's going to want to raise your heart rate it's going to want to hyperventilate and we'll talk about the other effects of getting into cold water in a second and cold shock. But a simple way to sort of overcome this is to put your face in and lift it up. This will stop that gas reflex, re gasp reflex and it will get you used to the cold water quicker. What to expect when you're in there? So it's gonna be cold. You're gonna expect some pain initially. It's gonna be a shock to your system. The cold water is gonna to touch your skin. It's gonna start act uh, activating your cold receptors on your skin this will tell your hypothalamus in your brain which is essentially your body's temperature sensor sensor that i'm in cold water i need to respond so your blood vessels are going to constrict in your extremities in your hands and feet it's going to feel like pins and needles it's going to feel like burning pain on your arms and legs essentially then you're going to go numb so that's good because you know that the cold water is work working and it's cold enough for you. But this happens generally at about two minutes. So the first sort of zero to two minutes, it's gonna be painful, you need to push through it. This is endurance, this is why we're doing this. We'd, remember, we're doing this deliberately, so we want this effect. After about two minutes, you can find yourself starting to relax. Your heart rate will lower, your breathing will become normal, and your pain and numbness will start to dissipate. You'll essentially become more relaxed in the water. Let's talk about cold shock. So cold shock, when you get into the water, is your body's response to that cold stressor. You're going to hyperventilate. This means you're going to gasp. It's called the gasp reflex. As you get in, you might have experienced this yourself or seen people do this. <gasps> As you get in now this can be a problem if you're in deep water because you don't want to swallow that water that could lead to drowning but essentially the cold water in your skin is touching those receptors that signals going to your brain hyperventilation can make your breathing rate expand and sort of raise 10 times a normal rate this is a problem if you're exercising because you want to be as relaxed as possible for sustainability essentially uh, vasoconstriction we've spoken about in a different video I'll link it here but let's talk about it briefly as you get in your uh, blood vessels in your extremities and your arms and legs are going to constrict these are the small blood vessels near to your skin this is going to keep your warm blood near your core this is your body's response to the cold water this is good we want this but that's where that pain and numbness comes from With vasoconstriction and with hyperventilation, this will become better as you train. So as you train for the cold water, the more you expose yourself and the le more length of time you spend in the cold water, it will generally affect you less. However, your body is still going to respond. So you're never going to get to a point where it feels like you're getting into a warm bath, unfortunately. Now, 
If we talk about the effects on the body, so we've got an increased heart rate, we've got higher blood pressure because you're essentially your blood vessels are closed, so your heart's having to work harder to pump that blood around your body. Serotonin in the body increases, and so do your inflammatory markers. Now, if a doctor was to measure your vital signs at this time, they might think that you are experiencing something quite bad or even you could be dying. This is what we want. We want to produce this cold shock response. Once all these things happen in your body, as soon as you get out of the water, studies have shown that for the next 20 hours, these same markers that were increased while you're going through that stress will be lower for the next up to 20 hours of the rest of your day. So if you're doing this at night, like we are, it's going to have benefits through your sleep. If you're doing this at the start of your day, you're going to experience that throughout the rest of your day. We're in the cold water. How long should we stay in? Well, we need to build up slowly. If you're new to this, maybe this is your first time, maybe this is the reason you're watching this video, you want to get in for about two to three minutes. You don't want to spend too long in the water. You want to build up slowly. It's not a competition. You want to let your body uh, acclimate over the course of a few weeks or a month, and that's gonna make those responses to the cold shock better, more efficient. You're gonna activate brown fat. You're gonna start to adapt to the cold water. Your body will come better at essentially constricting your blood vessels and keeping that warm blood near your core. The brown fat's gonna help to regulate your body temperature and you'll get better, weirdly, at shivering. Now, we'll talk about shivering in a second, but shivering is good. The important thing though is if you've got a friend that does this or if you're watching online and you're thinking to yourself these people are spending 9, 10, 15 minutes in cold water that's because they've been practicing they're used to it their body is more efficient at dealing with the cold it is not a competition and you should never compete with others so if you're doing this with friends and you're comparing scores this isn't like normal exercise this is potentially dangerous so you need to be careful with yourself and let yourself build up over time Let's talk about adapting to the cold water. So as you begin your cold water journey, your body will start to get better and more efficient at those responses to that cold shock. The hyperventilation become less, the um, vasoconstriction will, keep, will become more efficient and keep that blood near your core. Now, the mammalian dive reflex can help that, so we talked about that earlier when you put your face in, but also, generally, training will help this. It will reduce the effects, eventually eliminating that initial gasp reflex as well, so you won't feel like you need to <gasps> when you first get into the water. Brown fat is a thermoregulator. There are two types of fat in your body, white fat and brown fat. You can build your brown fat layer. This is something we've evolved over the years as humans to respond to cold. As you increase your cold exposure, your brown fat will become better at insulating your body and thermogenesis will kick in. Now this is where your body is creating its own heat. The hypothalamus in your brain is essentially your temperature um, regulator. And what that does is it, one, activates the brown fat, and two, it activates your muscles to shiver. Shivering is good. We call this thermogenesis. Essentially, it's a fast twitch of your muscles. You've shivered before when you're cold, but the reason your body is doing this is to generate its own heat. Essentially, twitching your muscles really, really fast back and forward to produce heat and keep your body warm and thermoregulate your core temperature. So the uh, benefits of cold water immersion and why are we doing this deliberately? Well, two people you should refer to. Dr. Susanna Soberg has very interesting research on this and she's coined the Soberg principle, which is something we've spoken about in the cold water series. And Dr. Andrew Huberman has very um, interesting ideas and he's interviewed Dr. Soberg and he's interviewed several other people that have studied this at PhD level. I am no expert, but I'll go through generally what they've spoken about. <laughs> When you get into the cold water, your body releases neurotransmitters. These are called catecholamines. These are dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. These have several effects to deal with the cold shock response. So the norepinephrine um, activates your brown fat and it starts your muscles shivering. But you also release dopamine. Now this is important in several ways because it has short-term and long-term benefits. The short-term benefit is that after you get out of the water, for the next sort of four hours, your dopamine levels will be sky high, as if you've 
been for a run that that feeling after exercise of feeling really good you can recreate this in cold water you'll also feel more comfortable in the cold water over time and generally in cold weather as well you'll be better at performing exercise in cold water if that is what you're trying to do so if you're swimming in open water if you're swimming in the sea or lidos over time with training and immersing yourself in cold water all of these responses to that cold shock are further training your body to get used to essentially what is quite an extensive reaction inside your body and you'll become better and more efficient at dealing with the cold your metabolism at a cellular level will increase now this has a caloric cost what i mean by this is inside your cells your mitochondria sort of the powerhouses of those cells that give your cells energy are working 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 and they will be working to feed your cells to shiver your muscles to generate that heat now this uh, costs energy you need to burn energy for this to happen and so this has a caloric cost what that means is you're going to burn your energy stored in your body to increase your body temperature this has benefits in terms of weight loss but it also has benefits in terms of adapting to the cold your cells will become more efficient at doing this Gibbous Dornis did a very interesting study in 2016. Um, they measured swimmers over a course of a winter season. And what they did was they took a group of sort of middle-aged people and they measured their stats at the beginning of the winter season and at the end. And what they found is that they had a lower resting heart rate, they had lower blood pressure at the end, and they also had a, a reduction in inflammatory markers in their body. Now this has benefits in terms of recovery from injury, um, recovery from surgery and after intense exercise as well. They also had increased insulin sensitivity. This essentially lowers the risk of lifestyle diseases such as type 2 diabetes and some cancers. Pain resistance was also better. They found that these people could tolerate spicier foods and essentially exercise to a higher rate as well. One thing to remember is not to go into cold water straight after exercising. It can inhibit muscle protein synthesis or myofibrillar hypertrophy. This is essentially your muscles recovering and building, increasing in size and density. Now it's more important not to get, in co not to get into cold water straight after weight training. It can be okay after cardio exercise, but generally try to avoid it for the first sort of two hours after the exercise. We've done an entire video on after drop i'll link it here so refer to that but after you get out of the cold water your blood blood vessels have been constricted they're going to start to open up as you warm up and that warm blood inside your core is going to rush to your extremities and it's going to lower as it recirculates around your body this is going to lower your core temperature and essentially you're going to feel colder for about two to four hours after you get out it's therefore important to warm up slowly so after you get out dry yourself off as we mentioned wrap up warm and wait for your body to work you're going to shiver wait for your body to work to warm itself up that's why we're doing this hypothermia can be a little bit dangerous when you're doing cold water immersion intentionally because essentially you are deliberately exposing yourself to cold water and you're trying to do it for a period of time so hypothermia is defined as a body temperature below 35 degrees this can cause you to shiver as I am doing now but you can get confused you can have slurred speech you can have blue lips and more importantly you can get muscle fatigue this can be a problem because you may not be aware of it also the intentional exposure can put you at risk because of getting out of the water so like we spoke about before we got in you need to have an extra strategy and you need to make sure that if you are in sort of large volumes of water i.e a lake or the sea that you can definitely get out of that water you you don't want to be too deep and you don't want to be too far away from your exit point of that water so that you can start to recover and get warm as you start to swim in that cold water we'll talk about this in a separate video but you will feel like you're swimming in custard so just be aware that when you start to exit that water it's going to be difficult so maybe if you're exposing yourself to cold water in large bodies that you exit sooner than if you were in a cold tub such as this because i can just flop out of this but if i'm in a if i'm out in the middle of the sea it's going to cost me more energy and it's going to be more difficult for me to get out thank you for watching this video if you have any questions please leave a comment below 
This is part of our cold water swimming series and we're going to touch on each of these topics individually and go into much more detail. But I just wanted to sort of bring you along with me getting into the cold tub and get myself intentionally cold. I'm starting to shiver so I'm going to get out, I'm going to get dry and I'm going to get warm. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.